Hey guys, um, thanks for subscribing to my channel. I hope you got to watch the first video where I introduced myself. Uh, now I kind of want to bring you back to uh, in the back of the kitchen. And I thought a lot about how I wanted to show what we make. Having you follow as I do it really how we do it for us was the more uh, real version of what it's like to be in the back of a bakery rather than specifically stage and follow a simple recipe. Um, so today I wanted to take you back and have you follow me while I do patachou, which is the, the dough that we use for the eclairs and profiteroles. So I actually do need to make this dough today and um, I figured it'd be cool to have you guys tag along and see how I do it and then I can chat about um, some tips and things that are going on in my business and yeah, just have you be part of that so you really get to feel the LPT3 and the production and and what we do back here. We're going to start with the eclair specifically today. We will include the recipe ingredients and all that stuff um, under uh, in the description so you can do it at home. I would highly recommend that the quantities that you do at home are a lot smaller so you may want to reduce by maybe a tenth just because we're going to make a lot of eclairs. In season we do about two to three times this recipe every week so that's a lot of, a lot of eclair shells but of season we're probably about once or twice a week. So I'll get started. I got a pot and I got an induction stove. We don't have gas here in Scottsdale in this building particularly so we work mainly with induction and then I have a um, spatula that's a bit harder than this one just because we're going to start mixing the um, flour in and when it's the, the soft rubber spatula I feel like it the dough is too rough for it, so I like to use like a harder, harder setting spatula. I have milk and water in this pitcher right here, so we're going to start with that. And then we have a little bit of salt, and then in this pot right here I have butter. So trimaline is a, a sort of sugar, it's, it's an inverted sugar, and it's kind of pasty. What it does, not only it sweetens slightly, it's kind of like this kind of paste preserves um, the, the dough a lot better. Those are all my ingredients in there. And I'll get started by bringing it to medium heat, just because that's gonna load the butter and trim it to melt. And what once it does, we're gonna actually boil it, but a heavy boil, just to make sure that we evaporate enough liquid content. Patachou is a very um, standard recipe in, in France. We use it a lot everywhere. Uh, even restaurants that are in bakery use patachou a lot. Uh, you can do little uh, cheese puffs and stuff like that with it. And so I just assumed that anyone who was a baker was probably apt to doing it properly. And when we first started asking people to do it, I was like, yeah, you just put those ingredients in and then you incorporate the, the flour and you incorporate the eggs. And I was like, yeah, sure, easy. And then Sometimes it would fail and we couldn't figure out why. And then other times it wouldn't. And then it would fail again and then it wouldn't. And one time I'm like, okay, well, wait for me. We'll do it together. Let's see what happens. And we realized that sometimes the ingredients didn't boil properly enough that we didn't, re like, we didn't eliminate enough of the water content. So then when we incorporated the flour, it was still very liquid instead of a dough and that created a lot of problems. Boiling it really good is a very important step in succeeding in the patachou. Right now I'm just melting the butter. So while that melts, um, I'm gonna start scaling my eggs. Um, the eggs is actually the one ingredient that is not set in stone. Um, so although we do start with a base amount of eggs that we think we're gonna use, it always depends on the level of hydration that's in the air or in the flour or how much we get to dry or evaporate the liquid content of our dough prior to adding the eggs. So I'm going to scale what I think I'm going to start with and then we have to play by, by eye um, basically when we finish the recipe. Um, so here at the bakery we use um, pasteurized already cracked eggs. They come in this big pillow. Uh, we go probably about 8 to 10 of those pillows um, a week, I would say. Um, it's easy because we don't need to get messy cracking eggs, which is kind of nice. And then also it's already pasteurized and all that, so we eliminate um, any kind of contamination that could happen in the process. And then for us, it also saves us time. Um, so 
I, I'm going to start by scaling what I think we might need, and then depending on that, we might add or not use at all. And I always use grams when I work. I just find that it's the most accurate method of scaling and measuring ingredients, just because I feel like cups measuring system always varies depending on the person that does scale or measure. Um, so if I push a cup down really hard, it's going to be a lot more weight than if someone kind of three quarter foot fills it. So we work with um, scaling system and then we also work in grams. The reason for grams is because it's a lot easier to uh, multiply or divide the recipes. Um, and so depending on how much we need, we can more easily map it out um, if it's, it's in proper programming. Right now, my, my butter has melted. So we're going to try to get into that really boiling stage. 99% of what we do here at Gel Patisserie, we use a what's called a fat butter. So basically the fat content of the butter is a lot higher than a regular butter. And um, that's primarily what we use for all of our poissons, viennoiserie, danishes and that kind of stuff. We use a higher fat content butter. But essentially what's happening here as it keeps trying to boil is it's evaporating a lot of liquid content, a lot of hydration and that helps dry out the dough a little bit. Once we do add the flour in, it's gonna be easier. All right, so it's almost boiling. We can see we're forming this little white foam on top and I need to boil even more than that. I'm gonna keep stirring it a little bit as it boils even more. What I now, that I understand that not everyone knew that it had to boil, what I tell them to reach is like that kind of volcano stage where it's just like heavily boils, not just to a cool simmer. I really need to see that happen before I add my flour, otherwise the recipe just doesn't work as well. And then we have, uh, for my recipe specifically, for my quantities, I have 1200 grams uh, of AP flour. I haven't messed around with using other flours, but I don't think that would work. That's why I haven't even tried. I think AP is really the best way to go. You don't need a certain amount of gluten. You're not trying to to build structure in that dough, you just need flour. If you do mess up before you add the eggs, just start over instead of trying to fix it after you've added the eggs, because that's really the, the expensive part of the recipes. It's better to start over than trying to fix it, especially this one. But right now it's boiling really, really good. Volcano stage, as I call it. So I'm gonna shut off the heat and I'm gonna add my flour. I'm gonna start mixing that flour in. I'm gonna turn my heat back on. If you can see right now, at the bottom of my pan, if I scratch it, it comes clean. I'm gonna cook it until I form a little film of skin on the bottom of, the, of my pot. And we need to stir constantly. And I also try to break up all those lumps of flour. Unless you have a very good tolerance to heat, don't go in with your finger and try to pinch it, because it's hot. So what you want to do also is kind of like make sure that you toss it around enough so not only the bottom um, cooks. So you want to make sure that at all times the dough keeps being tossed and flipped around so it's never the same dough being touching the bottom of the pan and cooking. It should be easier at home because unless you're cooking for a wedding, you shouldn't have to do that much quantity of a dough. Now, at the bottom, you can see I kind of created that, that skin that doesn't come off. So that's a good indication for me that the dough has been cooked through. And I like the consistency of the dough too. I don't see any flour lumps in there. And so I'm going to turn up my heat and I'm going to transfer that dough into a uh, mixing bowl with the attachment uh, of a paddle. I recommend a hook or a whisk. If you have the paddle, we'll definitely use that. Stir right now it's behind me. And because the dough is pretty giggly, it should pop right out of the pan without having me to like scoop it out. So I'm just gonna put it here. You can see the bottom of the pan just has that little film that's left in there. It's always a good sign, but the rest came out pretty clean, so that's good. So I'm gonna start paddling that on speed one. So um we only have three speeds in those big commercial mixers. I know the smaller KitchenAids usually have 10. Um, so when I say speed one, it's reference to have it be three speeds. If I, sp if I say speed two, I usually speak medium speed, so that would be about five on the 
small commercial, um, a small home mixer. And then if I say it's speed three, which is really rare, I guess it could happen, then that would be um, the maximum speed. And what I'm gonna do right away is start incorporating my eggs. And the reason why I scaled it in a pitcher is so I can just slowly incorporate it in the bowl and pour it in as I go, rather than have to stop it every time. And when I feel like it's getting pretty water in there, I take a break and I let those eggs incorporate for a little bit before I add the next section. I just don't want to add too much eggs at once, otherwise the dough would, could separate. So separate means that the, the fat and the rest of the content of the dough separate from each other, so you kind of get that like greasy film of fat um, coming apart. Um, right now I'm just gonna scrape the edges and you can see the dough is kind of like coming off my spatula I can't even lift it up. Definitely needs more egg and I'm gonna keep adding them. The amount of eggs that you add is It's really a game of experience. You don't want it too dry. If it's too dry the dough is not gonna puff up in the oven So it's gonna be pretty dense And if it's too much eggs the dough is gonna really explode in the oven and then you won't have that nice shell all around But the amount of eggs you add um, inevitably depends on how much you've dried the dough and how much humidity uh, it contains to start with. So even though you might always mix at a certain time that's worked for you, one day it might not, and that's because maybe that day it's raining, or maybe that day it's really dry, or your flour had a different hydration content, which could happen. So you always have to judge your skills when you add the eggs, rather than go by a, like a certain set amount. And so currently all my eggs have been added, but I can tell right away that my dough is still way too dry. It needs to come out on my spatula and it doesn't even want to come with it. So I know I need a lot more liquid. Let's do 300 more grams of eggs and see where that gives us. Even though I know it'll need probably more, I just don't want to put too much. Once I put too much, I can't go back. So. I'd rather do little by little than mess up an entire batch of patachou. I have to scrape the edges of the bowl a lot more often. I'm trying to visually make sure that this is the consistency that I want. And if it's not properly mixed with the edges, it might fool me to think maybe there is enough eggs. And then when I scrape the edges that have a bit more of the dough part, then I realize I was wrong. I'd rather over scrape the edges than not enough. Right now, it is sticking to my spatula, but I want it to start falling out of it a bit at a bit of faster rate. Last time it wasn't sticking at all, now it's sticking too much. You want it to stick, but you want it to be like leaking off in a way. What is called when it kind of starts running off, it's called a ribbon texture. So it creates this kind of ribbon dripping off. And we're not there yet, but we're really, really close. The same dough um, is used also to make churros. Uh, the difference with the churros is they're fried and then the eclairs, the profiteroles or the calibre are baked in the oven. Now we are finally done and you can see it get, kind of creates this ribbon dripping off and it does want to rip off, so drop off. So that's, that's really good and it's really smooth and silky and shiny and it's dripping and it gets that kind of ribbon. We really like the way the, the dough is right now. So that's gonna be that's gonna be it. Now I'm gonna try to scrape off all that um, excess dough that I got on that um, paddle just so I don't waste any dough. So see that ribbon texture? I'm just gonna save all that. Alright so I'm preparing to uh, pipe the eclairs. So I'm gonna grab a piping bag and then um, the tips that we use here at JL is 869. Tip that has like a bunch of little teeth that are bended in. And then so what I do is I put it in the piping bag and I kind of see where it ends and then I mark where I'm gonna cut it. I'm gonna retract it, cut the tip off and then push it back in. So then what I did is I twisted the piping bag and then pushed it inward so then when I fill up the piping bag it's not going to start running out 
I personally like to hold the piping bag in my hand, um, but if you want to work with a pitcher, because you feel like that's easier for you to have the piping bag be held over a pitcher, that works. And then I know the proper way is to like, work with a rubber spatula, but I think an ice cream scoop is actually the easiest way to fill up a piping bag. First thing I'm going to do is tilt my bowl a little bit and make sure that all my edges and bottom are properly incorporated. We're going to pipe it clear. So we use those mats um, that I like a lot to just kind of outline the shape of the eclair so it gives me uh, an idea of whether I'm going straight or not and also it gives me a consistency of the length of uh, the eclairs. And I'm going to fill up my piping bag. I don't like to fill piping bag that full. A lot of people just make the mistake that they think it's going to be more efficient if they fill it a lot at one time instead of having to refill. But they're actually a lot slower at piping at the beginning because holding a big full bag is actually really hard to pipe. Um, and also they're less accurate. And then I twist it and then I pinch my thumb and my index so then it doesn't come out the other way. And I just start piping. I try to have the dough be exactly the same width as my piping bag. So I'm trying not to push it out too much, but I'd rather just follow the line of the piping tip. And then also I'm at, when I'm at the end, I feel like I just don't have enough to do a nice one eclair so i'd rather just scoop it out and refill my bag rather than like have to stop halfway and then i do the same method i twist and i push the excess out and it's going to also stop it's going to create a little like plug in a way so that i can refill properly and because my bag wasn't like completely full i still have this entire area of of clean um bag so it doesn't get completely messy and it's kind of nicer when you can work clean and efficiently. And then, before I start piping, I'm gonna pipe a little bit out into my bowl to make sure I don't have air bubble between my last batch and my new refill. So the right hand is the one squeezing the content out because I'm right-handed. The left hand just guides where I'm going. And then when I get at the end, of my clear, I stop pushing and then I cut it through by We do um, three different eclairs here at Gel Patisserie. We have a vanilla, a chocolate, and a um, coffee. So what we do is we have a vanilla eclair that has a vanilla um, pastry cream, and then on top it has this vanilla glaze, and then the chocolate has a chocolate ganache or pastry cream, and a chocolate glaze and then the coffee has a coffee pastry cream and a coffee glaze. But I just grew up with chocolate being chocolate on top and vanilla being vanilla on top. So I like to be consistent with what I grew up with. Once we have a good shape of um, our eclair shells, 
that's when we open the vent, let all that humidity out, and then we're going to dry um, those shelves until they really crispy on the outside, so then they don't collapse when we take them out of the oven. And now I'm just going to load them in. It's going to take about 24 to 25 minutes. And they should come out golden brown. Hopefully they came out good. Awesome. Well, we're done baking, so we're going to pull them out. So those are our eclairs that we made. So we'll put them back on the speed rack and let them cool. And that is how you make eclairs. That is it for our eclairs today. Thanks for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you get to do it at home. If you ever have any questions, let us know. We want to be part of what you try to create and help you out if we can. Don't forget to like it and subscribe. And thanks again and always for your support.